Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? This is Station. I'm ready for the event. WABI, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. I have you loud and clear. How me? You sound great. Uh, uh, hello, Jessica. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, my name is Spencer Roberts, and I'm a reporter down here in Bangor, Maine. I had the opportunity to watch your launch with staff at the Challenger Learning Center here in Bangor. Uh, they were very impressed with how calm you were. They told me that you, they plan to use your story to help inspire Maine children about science and space exploration. I know you also got the chance the other day to speak with kids at your former high school. What's it like to be that inspiration? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think one of the most important parts for me about this mission and one of my major goals is really to share this with everybody because this mission is not just about me. There are thousands, hundreds and thousands of people down on the ground that have supported us in making everything possible that we do up here at the International Space Station. In, of course, all of the people that are working at NASA, those that are supporting this event in mission control right now, those that have trained us all along the way and prepared us for this, engineers that have designed all of these different modules, so many people all along the way. And personally, for me, in getting where I am now, all of the mentors, all of my family members, my friends, everybody that has really helped me reach these goals. This isn't just my mission, this is their mission, this is everybody's mission. So if I can inspire a child or any of these people to do something that just to, to look more at look at the world a little bit differently, to delve into a scientific question, anything that really sparks their imagination, then that is really an honor and I'm truly humbled by that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, residents of the state of Maine are, of course, proud to have one of our own up there. Um, but like you said, we know there's a lot of people behind the scenes uh, who make that stay up there possible. Do you know any other Mainers personally who work at NASA? I do, actually, and there are quite a few. My spacewalk instructor, who trained me and actually also led these last series of spacewalks that we conducted, is from Maine, Derek Porter. Uh, there's actually a couple other in the spacewalk group, James Montalvo, also from Maine. Uh, there's uh, Liz Phillips, who's one of our IT supports. And of course, you're all familiar with Chris Cassidy, another astronaut that's been in the office much longer than I have. And the great news for Maine, as I think all of you know already, is that we'll actually be up here together. We'll overlap for just over a week when Chris comes up here in the spring and before I leave. Oh, that'll be great. Um, did, uh, did training for microgravity uh, really prepare you for what it's actually like? Uh, did anything surprise you about your recent spacewalk with Christina? Well, the training that we get on all the technical fronts is absolutely incredible. It really prepares us for all the situations that we have up here. If we're talking about the spacesuits in general, you know, we have so much muscle memory from wearing those suits, from rehearsing everything in the neutral buoyancy lab, the big pool we have in Houston where we train. We've gone over all of that with the suits, with the tools, everything so many times that it does kind of just become ingrained in your muscle memory. But the one thing that you simply cannot train for or prepare for is what if feels like to be weightless. And it is still something that I can't really even describe. I have been on the KC-135 and other aircraft that fly in the parabola shape pattern, which I'm sure you're familiar with, we call the vomit comet. You can get about 30 to 35 seconds of microgravity on those airplanes on the ground, but even that just doesn't compare what it's like to have this prolonged weightlessness. In the beginning, I felt like when we launched in the Soyuz and first experienced it, you feel like suddenly you are hanging up down. So you feel like you're up here on the ceiling, hanging upside down, just like you're a bat or something, and all the blood is, is kind of rushing to your head. You know, everything is, is shifting upward. And it is a, a kind of a strange feeling, and it just doesn't go away. It's this prolonged feeling. You do start adapting to it quite quickly, though, when you get up here. And now, I mean, I like floating so much, I'm not sure I ever really need to walk again. It's just so much fun, and it, it really uh, turns you a little bit into a five-year-old. You know, all the time, you just kind of 
w why not just float here like this? Why not jump up and down and, and move your body all around just because you can? So it's a, uh, we, we, we're lucky enough to have a lot of fun while we're up here as well. That's great. Yeah, I, I imagine that microgravity can make uh, some tasks harder, but uh, is there anything that you found that in your day-to-day -day routine that is actually easier in microgravity? easier in microgravity well i don't i think it's interesting because our brains are so adapted to this 1g you know our entire species as humans has evolved under these con conditions of 1g so your brain is just really actually difficult when you get up here to convince your brain that if i let go of this it's not going to fall you know i remember especially in the first few meals i would turn a packet upside down and think that something was going to fall out. You know, that just doesn't happen. So I'd have to think about that a little bit to think about what's easier. I mean, obviously moving heavy objects, you know, when Christina and I were out there on the spacewalk, we were replacing this battery charge discharge unit, which weighs over 230 pounds. And so it has momentum. So you still need to manage that momentum. But of course, it, we can move it around a lot more easily than we could on the ground. Excellent. Um, so uh, NASA has the goal has set the goal of landing again on the moon in uh, 2024 as part of the Artemis program. Uh, what are your thoughts on returning to the moon, and are you setting your sights higher to try and be part of the Artemis program? Yeah, I think it is a natural next goal. We are always at NASA thinking about the next step. You know, we have had this continuous presence on the International Space Station for almost 20 years now, and we have learned so much and are still learning so much that will help us on these missions as we extend our presence even further when we go back to the moon, when we go back to Mars. Personally, I would love to go back to the moon. I do think it is a necessary step in order to use that journey as a proving ground before we go all the way to Mars. Some people think, you know, we've been to the moon before, and that's true, but it was decades ago with different technology, and we still have a lot of questions that are unanswered that we really need to address to demonstrate that we can go even further all the way to Mars successfully. I would love to be part of that, so yeah, perhaps that will be my new goal after this space station mission, but right now I'm just trying to enjoy the present. Excellent. Now, I think you guys are passing over the East Coast right around now. Can, uh, can you pick out your hometown from up there? I was trying to get some pictures of caribou leading up to the event earlier this week, and I did get a couple, but, you know, it's often overcast up there. So every time I was there, it was pretty cloudy. I could have some pretty good views of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, so I sent some of those pictures down, and, and hopefully you'll see some of those on social media soon. Right now, we are actually over South America. So we did, just a short time ago, come down through kind of... Um, Central, the central U.S. region on this last orbit. Uh, right now, we're passing over South America. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I would take the opportunity to encourage everybody listening to follow you on Twitter because I've seen some of your photos, and they're, they're pretty interesting. And every, all the other astronauts who are up there as well. Yeah, thank you. And even more photos on my Instagram account, so you can look there, too. <laughs> awesome. I did want to ask you, I, I, one of the photos I saw was the, the lettuce you guys are growing up there. Uh, how is that doing? I heard you were looking forward to, to having some salad. Is that in the near future for you? Actually, we had that this week, and that is a post that I'm working to get out, so hopefully I'll get that out really soon. But we did harvest the Mizuna lettuce, uh, and that was on Wednesday, and it was delicious. It was the best meal that I've had since I've been up here. I'm a big salad eater. I eat salad every day on the ground, so I was so excited to have this fresh lettuce. And Mizuna is a really, really tasty variety. It has kind of that strong mustardy flavor, and it was the texture was perfect. The taste was great. Uh, we all all got together, invited our Russian crew members down, and we each made our own little salad in a bag so we could add different things like pine nuts. I added some beets. Some We had some fresh onion left over from a JAXA resupply mission. Some olive oil balsamic made an amazing salad. So it was a real treat up here to have that fresh fruit and vegetables. That sounds great. Well, thank you. I think my, I'm out of time, but thank you so much for talking to me, and I hope it isn't too hard for you to return to Earth when the time comes. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much, and say hello to everybody in Maine for me. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the WABI portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from WBUR. Station, this is WBUR. How do you hear me? 
I have you loud and clear. How me? Jessica, thanks for joining Radio Boston from the International Space Station. I know you're really busy, so I'm going to jump right in. A couple of weeks ago, you and Christina Cook completed the first all-female spacewalk outside the International Space Station. Can you take us through how it felt stepping out for the first time? It was simply an incredible experience and one that I will never forget. For me, coming up here, it just was the most amazing experience of my life coming to the International Space Station, something that I had dreamed about since I was a kid. And let me tell you, I thought it would be amazing. I knew it would be amazing. It is even far, far, far more incredible and impressive than I ever imagined, and that's saying a lot. Going for a spacewalk was even taking it a step further. When you come out of that hatch and you look down and all you see are your boots and the earth below you in all of its beauty. It is really an awe-inspiring and humbling experience, and it was uh, just something that I re really never forget. I have to tell you, to the average person, it seems like it would be terrifying to be out there in the middle of nothing with a single tether. What does it physically feel like when you're out there? Well, one of the things, and I think it's a very useful aspect of our training, we have such an amazing training regime for our spacewalks and spacesuits down in Houston in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, the, the big pool where we conduct all of that training. So we have so much muscle memory in terms of how we maneuver around in the suit, the different switches that we have to throw for our life support system, all of the different tools that we use to accomplish the job. So one of the things, when you come out the door that first time, of course there are so many different thoughts going in your head. But the biggest one I think that's very common for most people in my office is, okay, I need to get this job done, not make any mistakes, rely on my training and do what I, what I need to do. So luckily, because you have all of that training really ingrained in you, all of that muscle memory, you just start doing your job. And sometimes we actually have to remind ourselves to, to take a moment to look back at the earth, to appreciate the magnitude of the beauty around us and what we are actually doing, because it's very easy to just get caught up in that job that we're very, very used to performing. People have very different emotions when they come out for the first time, so I didn't know what to expect. Um, I didn't have that fear of falling, which some a few people have said, or I wasn't scared. I actually just felt incredibly inspired and looking back at the beauty of the earth just incredibly fortunate to have that opportunity jessica i can see you and i have to tell our listeners you look like you're having a blast are you having the time of your life up there Absolutely. I'm not sure that I've smiled this much for a month consecutively in my life. And I've described it in, in recent interviews and even in the one that I just had, how it does almost take you back a little bit to your childhood. You know, I personally probably act that way all the time, but you can see it in all of our crewmates where, you know, you'll just be doing your average task and all of a sudden you maybe curl up a little bit, float around, and you just kind of do that because, because you can. And it, it brings this kind of childhood excitement, you know, just spinning around for a while for no good reason because without gravity, things are a lot more entertaining. You actually have mentioned a couple of times that this was a childhood dream, and according to the Press Herald, you actually wrote in your high school yearbook that your future plan was to go for a spacewalk. D did you really think this was going to happen one day? Have you been sort of single-minded about this from the beginning? It certainly was my dream the entire way, but I think I also always knew that there was such a small chance of it happening that I didn't think that it that it necessarily would. And I think that's true for all of us that are fortunate enough to end up in this position. We know that there are so many other people that are equally as qualified, would make great astronauts, but unfortunately, you know, there just aren't enough spots for everybody and there's a lot of luck involved. So all of us recognize that. Let's talk about the science of your mission for a minute. I understand that a big part of it is making repairs or improvements to the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is looking for evidence of dark matter, which I just have to say is so cool. <laughs> for us non-astronauts, can you give us a sense, what is that? What is the alpha spec uh, magnetic spectrometer, and why is it important to the future of space exploration? 
Yeah, the AMS is a very, very cool instrument, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, as you mentioned, and it is probably understanding everything about it is a little bit beyond my capacity as a physiologist, but not a physicist, but it is amazing. So it is collecting all of this high energy radiation that is coming from everywhere around it. And so it's looking at these high energy particles, looking for evidence, as you mentioned, of dark matter, of antimatter. So it will it already is telling us a lot about that environment, about all of those particles, about things like the origins of the universe. I think it's already sp spawned maybe thousands of scientific publications already. So really cutting edge astrophysics type stuff. So this, this spectrometer though, unfortunately, it, well, it's mounted on the outside of the space station, so it actually doesn't have a, any interface with us as crew members. It is just out there collecting that radiation, collecting those high energy particles, doing its job. It was never designed to be serviced by spacewalks. We weren't supposed to have to do anything to it. But unfortunately, one of the pumps in the thermal control system has failed. And so in order to ha maintain this instrument and to have it keep collecting its valuable scientific data, we have to do a series of spacewalks which are coming right around the corner to go out and fix it. It'll be, they'll be very, very interesting spacewalks because we had to actually at NASA design all kinds of new tools in order to fix this. As I mentioned, it wasn't designed with spacesuit interface interfaces. When we go out the door to fix something in a spacesuit, it ha we use special tools, things that you know you don't just have the same dexterity that you do in an in ungloved hand. So the engineers at NASA have designed these special tools, have flown them up there, and we're preparing for those spacewalks now. So hopefully we'll be able to repair AMS specific uh, successfully so we can keep getting data. I won't be doing those spacewalks. I'll actually be on the inside of the space station flying the astronauts around on the, the robotic arm, the Canada arm that we use to to capture visiting vehicles. We actually are about to depart to uh, send a release a visiting vehicle right after this event with the robotic arm. And so I will be flying the astronauts around as they re repair the AMS. So uh, Jessica, there's no glass ceiling in space, but you and Christina Cook broke one anyway. Do you ever think about things like that? Do you think about your history and your place in it? You know, it's not something that I came into this job thinking about. For me, this was always my dream. My previous work led to everything to get me here. And so a lot of it is just doing what we're trained to do. You know, we are, we came into the office and we were treated like everybody else. Christina and I were treated the same as our male colleagues. Interestingly, our class was the first time that we had 50% female and 50% males. So we really already felt equal. We were held to the same standard. We received the same training. So for us going out of the door that day to do that spacewalk, it was really just doing our job, doing what we were trained to do. At the same time, it is not lost on us that it is a special event. It is a historical event. And for me, I think it's just really awe-inspiring to see that it's just becoming a regular event. It just makes sense. We've actually had a, a continuous female presence on the space station now for quite a while, and that just reflects how far we've come in society. We have more women in all of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, so it just makes sense that we're starting to see equal representation on all fronts, and I think that's very exciting and hopefully inspiring for everybody that hopes to follow. Jessica, what is your vision for the future of space exploration? Well, right now, I think it's an amazing accomplishment that we've had this continuous presence on the International Space Station for almost 20 years, if you think about that kids these days, or they're not even kids anymore, that are 19 years old, almost 20 years old, have never been alive when we didn't have a continuous human presence up here. So I think we are doing the right thing by maintaining our presence in space. We are also doing the right thing by maintaining our international partnerships and realizing that things are done better when we have a diverse and international team. We're up here every day working with our Russian counterparts. We have an Italian crew member up here from the European Space Agency. We often have Japanese and Canadian astronauts and that really shows how well you can do a job when you bring all of these teams together. So I think, personally, we need to continue with that trajectory, and we are for our future planning. The next thing you need when you're thinking about the future of spaceflight is what's that next step? When are, what are we going to do after this? We want to continue to progress and advance, and our administration has announced that we will be going back to the moon on our journey to Mars. So that's exactly what we should be doing, looking, keeping that vision moving forward. I also am very 
excited and encouraged by the fact that we are continuing these partnerships and expanding to include commercial companies. These partnerships we, that we have with companies like SpaceX, like Boeing, Northrop Grumman for resupply vehicles are all only making us stronger because we're bringing different pieces of technology and expertise. And I think we've realized now as a government, no one government can really do this alone with the scale of what we're trying to accomplish in space. But by combining all of these entities together, we can get the job done. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to talk to you again once you're back on the ground. In the meantime, stay safe. Okay, thank you very much, and please give my best to everybody in Boston. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you to all participants from WABI and WBUR station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you.